Okay, so this video is the last one in the whole series, and this is the one where we do kind of the most important, but kind of maybe even anticlimactic step, which is to take your map and turn it into an essay. Okay, and that sounds like the whole deal, but it really is going to be hopefully anticlimactic because it's going to be easy and so less stressful. We've already done the stress and the hard work in building the map. This part should be easy. Okay, it's going to be a recipe. All right, so but we've got a few a few parts here that are broken it down into. So the first thing we're going to do is just quickly recap the intros and conclusions, right? But then we're going to talk about the trickiness, and then the solution to the trickiness in two parts. So first, I don't know how long it's been since you looked at the, but here's just the the couple slides just to remind you, right? First paragraphs have three jobs to do. One of the key ones here is this plan, right? This is part of communicating the argument, prepping the reader to appreciate the argument that you're gonna be steering them through in the body. And similarly, the conclusion, same three jobs approximately, right? But one of the important parts of it here is again, reminding them of the highlights of the argument so they can remember the good things that you did in there and not forget about those good things, right? And both of those, the, the key importance of both of those jobs in the intro and the conclusion is because of the big problem that we're going to have, that we have to solve when it comes to writing an argumentative essay in words, okay? <clears throat> and that is the map. The map is a problem. And the map is a problem because it's not essay shaped, right? The map accurately visually represents the real logical structure of an argument, right? It plots out reasons. It plots out support, okay? And it's, that's, this is just the way things are. This is the true um, nature of your argument is that it looks like this, okay? It's got different branches. It's two dimensional. It spreads out in terms of different reasons, different branches, and it spreads down in layers of argumentation and evidence and support. And it plots, describes logical connections between claims. Contrast that with essays, with any kind of writing. Instead of being branching, instead of having that kind of structure, it's sequential. It's just it has to be read in order, right? Left to right, top to bottom, right? There's no, there's no, I mean, you could kind of hop around here, but it's not designed, most writing is not designed to just have the reader freely hop around. Unlike a map like this, right? Where you can freely kind of hop around and as you're hopping around, you, you're not losing yourself because you can see the whole map, right? You know kind of where you are. So you can hop around in this map without kind of losing your place. It's harder to hop around in a sequential essay, right? Um, here we have it all visually represented. Here we are gonna have transitions between things. We got paragraphs, we look at their structure here, but it's totally different from this. And the most important thing here is this is a narrative. It's a sequential, it's a narrative order. You're making some choices about what order things you want to present things to your reader in. And here we didn't have to make any choice about order, right? About sequence. This was, it's all here, all at once. They can zoom in to read contents, right? But even when they zoom in, they're, they're not losing the kind of the context of where they are in the overall map. Here, super easy to lose that stuff. So this is a big, this is the problem we have to, is that essays, writing, or any kind of communication, speeches, right? Videos, they're, they're all linear, right? Uh, so they are awkward fits for just what the true nature of an argument is. So we're gonna have to make some special efforts to repackage the true nature of our argument, which is like this, into kind of these art, the artificial constraints of an essay or a speech or something. So th something's going to have to give the, the informativeness of this and how it gets communicated visually as a map, 
hopefully you've come to appreciate that this really has big advantages. We're losing all those advantages when we put them back into an essay form, which we kind of, I, I might argue, hey, screw the essay, just hand this hand in the map. Um, but until that happens, you're gonna have to present it as an essay. So we're gonna have to figure out how can I present this map as an essay while still communicating the mapness of it, while still communicating all the logical relationships that so easily get depicted in this visual medium here. How can I write about them in words? That's what we're gonna solve today, okay? So briefly speaking, the plan here is what we're going to do is we have to we have to find we have to decide on a sequence right when you're writing about things uh, in writing or when you're writing a speech right delivering a speech it ha we have to get a linear sequence this then this then this then this then this right so to do that we're going to plot a path through our argument where it covers the whole map eventually right and so the key is going to be that we plot a sensible path through the map about first we're going to talk about this then this then this and in whatever order we pick but we have to pick an order we're going to plot that path through our map and then we are going to tell people vaguely about it in that first paragraph's plan and then we're going to execute that path this is how we're going to write the actual body of the paper is we're going to plot this path and then we're going to write the paper just saying this then this then this and, and however the path goes that's the order in which we're going to plunk down our claims and we're going to help keep the reader understanding where we are in our map even though they're never seeing our map we have to be careful to do that and we're going to do that with the plan in the first paragraph to give them a little bit of forewarning about kind of what our map vaguely looks like how many branches it's got that kind of thing but then during our trip through the map in the body we're going to have transition sentences cues to help them visualize to help them understand the shape of our map and, and what it looks like and where we are in it right now and stuff like that but we're going to have to do all that in words because we can't just share the map with them well i mean you could, but we're not going to, right? We're one hand tied behind our back. We're going to do all of this. We're going to have to describe our map in words as we're going through the actual content of our map. We also have to go through the shape of it. We have to communicate that to our reader as well. Okay, so plot a path through the map. There's so many ways that you could plot a path through the map. Okay, so I've got just three examples here. It's still, it's the same kind of dummy argument that I had on the previous thing. They're all the same map, but they just have different um, paths through them, right? So you can see the orange line here. I do this branch first, then I hop back up here and I do this, and then I hop to this sub branch here and finish off this one reason there. Red, I go here, let's do this, and then this reason, and then this guy here, and then I go back and do this R note, and then add R, and I'm working my way kind of down, but then I break my rules, and I go all the way down here and back up, and that one's really confusing. This green one here, um, I start in the center with the more complicated branch, and I do that, and then I do this weak, lonely one reason over here, and then I end off with my discussion of my objection. Okay, so maybe this one clearly, that's weird and hard to follow, but like, should I pick this map, this route through my map, or should I pick this route through my map? It depends. Uh, it doesn't matter in terms of logic. It might matter in terms of rhetoric. You might think, you know what? It's rhetorically stronger, more persuasive for me to end by dealing with and, and crushing the objection. Or maybe I should start with that so I can end talking about, I should bury this small stub of a reason right here, this small stub of a branch, bury that in the middle somewhere. Nobody really needs to notice it. Or I don't know. Those are all choices that you can make. They're not going to be super consequential, at least to my mind, because if we plot a good path, and we describe and we're a good guide along the way, not letting our reader get lost, then any of these is gonna be just fine in that it's gonna communicate accurately in words, the shape of our map, okay? So, but I do have some kind of rules of thumb, some guidelines about how we pick the right, a good path through. There might be more than one good path. There's plenty of bad paths like this red one here, right? So some general rules. 
First, we want to minimize these, these big horizontal jumps, right? Or big diagonal jumps from a, the tip of an argument up to the top here, right? That's what made the red map path here bad. It's just kind of willy-nilly, just going from random box to box. That's too confusing, right? We want to minimize the number of big jumps that we take. We need to include R notes and basis boxes in our route through the map. G answers, that stuff goes in the conclusion generally, so we don't need to worry about including those on our path. Those are just going to end up in the conclusion. But R notes for key links between crucial parts of our, our argument, those need to be included in our path because we're going to want to say something, some little side commentary about the, the keyness of that connection and why it's a good connection that that and we articulate it for our readers so that they can understand that it's a good relevant reason for supporting the box above it. We want to have that in our route. We want to mention the, the sources of our uh, claims, citations, right? But also other things, common belief, right? You, a little aside there, right? This shouldn't be controversial. Everybody knows blah, blah, blah. When they were growing up, they remember this kind of thing, right? Or something like that. Sometimes it might not be super necessary to include in your actual written essay uh, the basis box that identifies the source and evaluates the source. That might be a little bit of overkill. You might be able to get away with just really, really briefly saying something about that, but we need to be aware that often we are going to have to do that, right? And generally, in part, in concert with minimizing big jumps, we do want to finish off a map branch. You want to work all the way down to the bottom of something before you hop back up, right? So if you look at this is the middle branch and it's kind of got two sub branches on it. So if I went, once I pick and I start at the top here, I want to work my way all the way down. I work my way all the way down. Then I jump back up to the other sub branch and work my way all the way down there. Right? And I want to do one and then bump, jump back up and do two. And then I jump back up and do this other independent reason over here. That's kind of how we want to do it. All right. So the transition statements and you guys, I'm sure, have spent a lot of time, almost as much time as you did in college writing one and two on thesis statements. You probably spent a lot of time talking about transition sentences. Right introductory or concluding sentences in paragraphs and how to write those. That's what, that's what we're going to use to communicate the shape of our map, These, especially for big jumps, to make sure that our reader understands how we're hopping around and, and we have to communicate the logical structure of our map in words. That's what transitions are going to do. Every time we jump from box to box, we have to make sure that our reader knows we're jumping from one box to another box and what kind of jump that is. Right? So these green arrows here, well, that's a big jump from the thesis to our first issue, right? which is not actually a reason in favor because the path I chose is going to start with the objection, which is totally fine. That's often a good rhetorical technique to start with the objection, start with the, the biggest reason not to believe my point. And then as you can see, as I work my way down here, I'm going to get to my objection to the objection, right? So I talk, I present the objection, I give you, I'm a very charitable and fair person. So I give you a reason to support that objection and think, hey, this is why people think this is a reasonable point of view to have. And I've got an R note here. And so you can see how this this thing here is seen to back this up, right? And this also gets its own reason, so a reason for a reason for the objection. I'm being super fair and really showing you that people, why people think this is a powerful objection, then bam! Here's my rebuttal. Here's why I think this doesn't hold any water, and if this is not true, then this is, then that's gonna deplete support, maybe even refute this. Right? So I've done that, I've defused this objection, now I have a big jump up to my first, my primary, my chief reason in favor of my conclusion. Right, So big jumps are presented in our path through here as these big long um, horizontal and sometimes also vertical diagonal jumps between branches of my argument. In the essay, usually new paragraphs. That's the only kind of visual uh, signal that we can send our readers is a, a new paragraph. Now it's not the only one. 
Um, it might be something in your discipline. Um, lots of disciplines kind of allow for section headers, right? You do a market analysis, section headers. You do a lab report, section headers on different things so that people can locate stuff, right? You can do that for argumentative essays as well, right? Um, as long as it's not too weird in the discipline, right? Some disciplines might frown on that mightily, right? Like maybe literature, they don't like that stuff because they think you ought to have style and that you should be able to accomplish um, communicating big jumps in a subtler way than just having big section headings. But in philosophy, in psychology, and lots of others, just, hey, there's, there's section headers, there's big visual breaks like that where they talk about different parts of the argument that they're presenting with bold face headers, section headers in the, in the paper, right? When you're making a big jump like that, not only do you probably need a visual break of at least a new paragraph, if not a section header, but you probably want a little bit of a wrap up, right? That kind of finishes off the thing that you just completed and sends a clear and obvious signal, I'm on to a new part of my map, right? So when I make this jump from here to here, I want to make it clear that I have finished dealing with the objection and I think I did a good job dealing with it and it's not a big danger to my overall argument and then I want to send a clear signal now I'm on to the first positive reason in favor of my thesis and it doesn't need to be a whole paragraph it's one sentence will manage all of that stuff right but usually big jumps require that one particular huge sentence that a full sentence that really is dedicated towards sending that message to the reader. I have finished a branch, I'm on to the next one, all right? Other jumps in this map root here, jumps to evaluations, right? So jumps to, to R notes or jumps to basis boxes, right? Those evaluations are there as kind of a meta commentary where you are kind of observing the strength of the argument being presented, right? Hey, th this thing is relevant to that. As a reminder, just in case you can't see it, here's why this is relevant support to the box above, right? So you insert it as some kind of side commentary, right? You're being reflective, you're breaking that fourth wall and talking right to the person who's reading it explicitly, that's okay. You can do that in academic papers. You can say something like, you know, in case you find this controversial, I got it from this government or nonprofit organization, they do good work, so yeah. I agree. This is a, might be a surprising claim for you. I got it from a very trustworthy source that has no conflicts of interest, right? Super small jumps. These ones right here, from here to here, right? And then from here, that even though this is a sideways jump, it's still in terms of map and, and where you're going, small jump. That's where you have little to no transition sentence. You only need really subtle cues to uh, help your reader understand what's happening in the map and how you're moving around it, right? These are those indicator words that we were using to break up um, um, arguments into maps in the first place, right? Words like because or however or a second reason is. All of those things, we're going to add them in here, to, right? So, so here, right, we've got, we present the objection claim. Why would people think that? Because of this. You could actually say that in an essay. Why would people think that? Question mark. Bam, here's some support, right? Or you could say just because and into this, right? And then this is sensible because this, right? Or um, since this, this, right? And then however this makes this harder to believe, something like that, right? So there's lots of really subtle things that you're gonna do just naturally, usually these small jumps, that stuff doesn't require any effort at all to make sure that sometimes not saying anything you just say this and then directly after say that you don't need a because and it communicates stuff just fine we're pretty good at figuring out especially downward movement in a map when you write it in an essay it's the sideways jumps that might require a small clue or cue for the reader to understand what what's going on but really we have to take the most care with the big jumps and the jumps to evaluations all right, so in summary, what I'm saying here is the map is your plan for the body. We don't need to overthink it. We're just gonna literally copy paste contents of boxes. And then when you make leaps, maybe a little bit of language to kind of 
um, communicate the leap on the map, the path through your map. You want to communicate that to your reader. But 90% of the body is just co copy-paste parts of the map. Right? That's all we're doing. Don't overthink it. We did all our thinking in building the map, doing the actual writing part, not much thinking involved. We've, it's already complete. Just write the map. Write the map. Right? Also, forget word count. Okay? Even though your map might look complex, right? You take a look at this and say, what is that? It's like a dozen sentences, right? So that's going to make for a really short, you might think, awkwardly and embarrassingly short essay but if it gets the job done it doesn't matter how short it is you're just you just discovered you're super efficient which can be scary but that's okay forget filler if you really do think you need to add info to flesh out um because i have probably been really encouraging you in boxes just say it simply say it short if you want to now fancy it up if you want to say if you want to take a couple sentences to express the idea or the claim in a particular box go ahead and do that but make sure it's just talking about that box don't go all talking about everything because you want to have that structure that our map had it's gonna all that information is gonna be there we want to stay focused so don't don't go overboard there right and then after you've after you plunked that stuff down then we do proofreading we do editing right to kind of massage it to to make it read nicely because just plunking claims in doing the copy paste and stuff and then adding in some transitions might make it really kind of clunky reading and so yeah you want to massage it, make it read nicely, but don't rearrange stuff. Just surface sentence level edits and proofreadings just to make it look nice. This should all make sense, but it's going to be scarily efficient. But try it out and see what it looks like. Okay. I wanted to wrap up this video just by really talking about those transition sentences because I know you probably have been taught about them before. And one of the things I really want to warn against is if you have been taught the transition sentences, the job of a transition sentence is to connect different topics. That is, you, you finished off this paragraph whose topic was this, and now you're going to start this paragraph on a different topic, and you have to have a transition sentence to tell the reader, I'm stopping talking about this topic, now this one, I have to find some link between the two and my transition sentence is a way to to segue nicely and smoothly from one topic to another that's wrong that's bad okay and the reason why is simple because those topics aren't as different as you're thinking they are both of those topics in your essay both those two paragraphs that you think you need to write a transition to link together they're already linked there is a link there's a reason why both of those paragraphs belong in the same essay okay and the, the thing that they have a connection with is the thesis statement so don't try and artificially come up with a smooth connection between the topic of one paragraph and another that's just going to confuse the reader and distract them from the real reason both of those paragraphs topics show up in the same essay which is you had the you want to talk about both those things because they're both involved in the argument in support of that thesis so say that the transition sentence should wrap up a branch right and say okay so that was a reason that i think um, makes you believe this but it's not my only one i got a second here it comes that's all you need it doesn't need to be this oh i was talking about orangutans over here and now i'm talking about snakes they're really different animals. I have to find some way to, to relate them. No, that's not it. I was talking about ecologically sensitive animals and their environments. That's why both orangutans and snakes, even though they sound like really different animals, they're both the same because they're both ecologically vulnerable to, to overdevelopment or cutting down forests or something like that. That's what I should be reminding my reader of. Right? Not only are orangutans affected by development and, and cutting down of forests, but other creatures like snakes are too. And here's, and now, so now I'm going to talk about an example of where snakes got affected by this too. That's what a good transition ought to do. So talk about that stuff. Don't invent some artificial connection between two topics in your paper. Revisit the real connection, the real reason both of those two topics are there. The thesis statement. Okay. When you're doing those transitions, 
and you're thinking about a concluding sentence, so you've finished off a branch and you're trying to wrap it up before you move on to the next thing. You want to summarize the effect of that paragraph's discussion. You want to summarize the effect of that branch. How did it support the thesis, right? Is this your main reason? Does this just cover half the thesis? Is this specifically, is that reason branch specifically pitched at a particular audience? And now, introductory sentence, I'm now gonna deal with this other audience that might have different concerns or values. And so that the next branch, the next topic in the paper is specifically targeted at those people. What's the deal here? What, what was, what's the effect of this? Am I, am I halfway to, um, to successfully, to, to, to sufficiently defending my thesis? or a third of the way, or, or what? You gotta characterize it something like that to give your reader a little bit of a breath, a little bit of a retrospective on what have we accomplished so far in what I just finished, right? So here's an example just from a, a history paper where they were talking about the Black Death and whether, I think the, the thesis statement for this was, um, the Black Death has is a more important historical factor than even the most murderous dictator something like that right and so here this is a wrap up this is a conclusion to one part of it right the black death body count so we're just talking about deaths right clearly beats any human beings efforts not even the worst people come close right and then that's going to let me talk then about the um, impact on infrastructure or on political systems of the black death versus how dictators or other kind of awful people like Genghis Khan or something like that affected the, po the politics from generations to come or something I don't know you can do a concluding sentence and then really have the transition focused on concluding and wrapping up something and then it's just a quick okay and then second reason or you can have a really brief conclusion if it's kind of obvious about the effect of that branch that you're wrapping up and spend more time introducing the next thing you're, it's kind of your it's a judgment call as to where the emphasis is usually if you do a good concluding sentence you don't really need to spend much effort introducing the next thing and vice versa, right? But an introductory sentence is just supposed to help the reader anticipate what's coming. So it's like a conclusion, but before you actually present the branch, right? So here, though there was trade in medieval times, modern trade is more efficient and bigger part of the economy. That just signals, I'm gonna be talking about trade and comparisons medieval versus modern, right? But the clear thing here is when you make those big jumps in your map, you want a transition to help the reader understand big jump coming we're talking about a totally new branch here or something but you don't really need to do both usually a concluding sentence and an introductory sentence you can usually get away with just having one and then just not worrying about the the second thing but we'll see we'll see how yours turns out try it with just one and maybe i'll say no no, no we need a little lead off here right okay so this is all together. This is the recipe after you have produced your map, right? Because the map is the place where we sunk all our intellectual energy into developing the map that is the argument of your paper. This is how you write your paper after you've got your map. You have a first paragraph. It does three jobs, right? It does one new job that's not included in your map. Then it does the thesis, which is in your map. And then it really just, you know, my map has three main reasons, right? For bam, that's your plan. Right? Then the body, the map is the plan. You just paste box contents and then like massage them so they read nicer. And you add in um, transitions and other cues to help the reader follow your path through your map because you don't want them getting lost. You want to be that good guide, right? And then you wrap it up with a conclusion with three jobs. You restate the thesis, you recap highlights if needed. If you did a good job here, such that it was really transparently communicated the shape of your map and your path through it. You don't really need to spend much effort doing that. And then last shot is add some perspective, some context. That's your last shot at impressing the prof. And that's it. This stuff right here should literally take minutes, not hours. We spent hours on the map. We spend minutes on the writing. All right. So the next thing after you finish watching this is you do it for your map. This really should take you like 10, 15 minutes, maybe half an hour, not hours, right? Um, and then 
submit it and then we'll see and we'll see oh, did you get good transitions in and then it should be kind of clearly obvious right okay do we need more kind of clues in here to more clearly communicate the shape of my map so that the reader follows where I am in my argument map um, that's one set of issues we have to worry about and then the other one is like the style does it read nicely or is it really kind of clunky and feel kind of artificial okay massage the language and stuff like that right so this is the part hopefully right where we're at that transition we're at that special moment that I showed way 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 back when right when I was talking about trust and learning theory right about Miyagi I, I made you do all this stuff here's where it all comes together right where I now am yelling at you and throwing punches and you are painting the fence and waxing the floor and, and it's all magically now you know karate uh, this is the now you know karate moment of, uh, of critical of critical essay writing um, so hopefully it kind of comes together but just like that right even though that was kind of idealized it was a Hollywood kind of moment you could see he had to correct things right no, no 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 paint the fence with with stiff with stiff wrists and stuff like that so we're still gonna have that right we have to it's not just directly oh, okay you can do it on you don't just know karate now there's still work to be doing but hopefully we've done 90% of it and that last 10% relatively easy and that's the part also that you're going to be able to do on your own because you have experience with writing that that can help you with this now you don't totally need my advice here now you'll be able to see what parts are clunky and how to massage those but maybe the hardest part of writing an essay which is just the content thinking what to say totally already dealt with that because we built a map so go get this done and we'll see what it looks like